I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Raymond Chow, a physicist best known for his experimental work in quantum optics. He's currently an emeritus faculty member at the University of California Merced Physics Department, where he's conducting research on gravitational radiation in collaboration with Professor Jay Sharping. Ray Chow has become known in the field of quantum optics due to several important experiments. Based on former experiments carried out by Gunter Nimps in 1992, he measured the quantum tunneling time, which was found to be 1.5 and 1.7 times the speed of light. He was also the first to measure the topological Berry's phase. As of 2006, Dr. Chow accepted a faculty position at UC Merced and turned his full energy to the project of detecting gravitational waves through the use of superconductors. By 2010, he had become an emeritus faculty member, but continues to advise several PhD students. So, Ray, welcome, sir. It is truly an honor to have you with me today. We are discussing your concept for gravitational wave communications using spin gravity coupling via pairs of entangled electrons and YIG ferrite sphere. So, this is a very complex idea. So, I want to break this down simply for the audience. Essentially, we're using quantum entanglement to convert gravitational waves to EM waves for communications, right? Yes, that's right. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, so let's get into the model. And I'm going to share the screen here in just a moment. We have two experimental chambers, each containing two small entangled levitating YIG spheres. As the gravitational waves hit the spheres, they tilt towards each other which lets us convert gravitational waves to EM or vice versa. And I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay. So as we can see on the left, we have a transmitter. On the right, we have a receiver. Each one of these chambers, and these are grounded to Faraday cages, has two pairs of YIG spheres in them. And they are levitating and they're entangled with each other. So as a gravitational wave hits each pair of spheres, they tilt towards each other. Is that kind of where we're at with things? Yes. Uh, let me just uh, clarify. Uh, YIG stands for yttrium iron garnet, which is a kind of ferrite material, a, a magnetic material. And so th that's crucial for uh, entanglement here. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, so let me actually go to another one of your slides. Okay, so this shows uh, the spins of two entangled electrons uh, when a passing gravity wave causes them to tilt, right? So they're entangled. When the gravity wave hits, they tilt towards each other. I wanted to show this to the audience so they get a better understanding of, of what you're talking about. Right. Uh, there's an analogy which helps here. Uh, imagine that you had two compass needles instead of two electrons, and the spins of the electrons are the directions of the two compass needles. Well, as the uh, gravitational wave passes by these uh, uh, compass needles, there is a squeezing of space uh, uh, due to the gravitational fields g uh, and minus g on the left and uh, on the right there is a stretching of space uh, denoted by minus g and g uh, respectively in the upper and the lower uh, halves of the uh, figure here and uh, the fact that the space is being squeezed on the left and stretched on the right means that uh, the uh, compass needle's directions in, shown in the red arrows will tilt towards each other. Uh, and so that's the idea. Uh, the, uh, the point is that spin is a gyroscopic uh, object and it follows the local direction of inertial space. And that's why what's happening here. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, and again, we're going through this very quickly. This is something that you had presented at the APEC conference. I will put a link into that full presentation in the notes, but I think it does help to be able to go through this in interval interview format. 
and basically just kind of showcase um, the basic idea as well as some of the applications. And there are a lot of applications that you won't be able to get into there. So the, the secret to this is something that's called spin orbit coupling, if I understand correctly. And um, so the, the way that I have that written down is the spins of two entangled electrons in a passing gravitational wave tilt towards each other, which can be measured. This change in spins leads to a resonance that can be measured to extract a communication signal. So you have these, you have the electron spins and they change. It leads to a resonant value that can be measured. Is that kind of where we're at? Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's a simplification, but uh, it sort of captures it. Um, that there, there is another slide. If you could go to uh, the slide thirteen uh, there, that explains spin resonance. I think this would help the audience. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, and thank you so much. So the uh, basic idea is uh, that there is something called magnetic spin resonance, which uh, is pictured. Uh, graphically uh, uh, sketched here, and 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 in it, um, there's a, a DC magnetic field, B naught in purple there, that's pointing upwards vertically, and when it's applied to a spin S, uh, which is in red, in particular the spin of the electron, what happens is the spin starts precessing in a circular orbit that's uh, um, shown in blue here. And so um, it, <clears throat> if you apply then an RF um, magnetic field shown in the uh, uh, purple in small letters, BRF, RF stands for radio frequency. And it happens that this RF frequency is coincident with the frequency of precession of the red arrows. Then you hit a resonance in which you can transfer energy from the RF uh, field to the spin field or vice versa. You could either emit or absorb power from uh, the radiation field uh, in this magnetic spin resonance. Uh, just to make it a little bit easier to understand, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, for that's a big, uh, uh, very important uh, imaging uh, for uh, the human body, uh, and, and this uh, is uh, this magnetic spin resonance is at the heart of that imaging um, technology. But here uh -huh. we we are using the spin resonance for a different reason. We are using it to generate um, gravitational waves or electromagnetic waves, depending on which direction we are um, doing the uh, uh, process, uh, processing the transfer of energy. Anyway, so the, the, this picture helps understand the idea of magnetic spin resonance and ma magnetic spin precession. Okay. That, thank you. So let me bring it back to, again, this is the actual experimental setup that you're describing. And as you mentioned, there's a transmitter and a receiver, and I'll, I'll get into the, some of the applications in just a moment. But so uh, it, it's, it's kind of a bi-directional process, right? You can use electromagnetism to generate gravitational waves. You can use gravitational waves to generate electromagnetic waves. Therefore, you can create a communications apparatus and there are also a lot of other applications that we'll get into in just a moment. Um, so if it's okay, I want to ask about spin orbit coupling. It's known to exist. It's larger in entangled states and ferromagnetic materials. However, spin coupling is normally extraordinarily weak. So even a much higher coupling may also be very weak. Um, are there any examples of how strong this could potentially be? Yes, well, the, uh, what you say uh, is predicated on the fact that, you know, uh, a single electron couples weakly uh, to this is spin couple, uh, spin orbit coupling is indeed very weak for a single electron. But when you have 
uh, Avogadro's number of electrons, as is the case in these Ig spheres, then you have a very large coupling uh, because it's cooperative. Uh, you have all the spins moving or tilting together in synchronism. And so you generate a much larger signal, even though the signal uh, uh, for a single electron is, is small. The, uh, the fact that you have Avogadro's number, uh, number of electrons in these spheres is uh, very large. So that mm. they, uh, the, the effect here is very large. Uh, uh, we put in some numbers uh, and uh, it shows that uh, this experiment is uh, on, doable on the watt level. In other words, we can generate watts of gravitational wave power starting with watts of electromagnetic wave power and vice versa. If you have watts of gravitational wave power uh, on the right coming into the, the right sphere, the half of the, the receiver part, that will uh, convert into watts of uh, electromagnetic wave power. So it may seem that the spin orbit coupling for a single electron is very small, but when you add it up for uh, uh, 10 to the 23 uh, or Avogadro's number roughly of these um, electrons, then it's huge. Okay. Yeah. So watts of power. Let me put it before we close the slideshow down. Let me put it on a photo of a YIG sphere. And I believe you were saying this was yttrium, iron, and garnet, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's right. This is uh, taken from a uh, Wikipedia uh, article uh, on YIG spheres or YIG ferrite. And it, um, uh, you can buy this commercially. Um, and Basically, the, the way it's produced is very interesting. You take a single crystal uh, with a strong from melt, uh, uh, and then you uh, put the crystal inside a tumbling machine that uh, tumbles a single crystal so that it gets uh, polished, and uh, it's called a gem polishing machine. And that's how you make these egg spheres. That you see in this photo. Um, well, so let me let me stop sharing, and let's let's go back to our questions now. So, um, thank you for walking us through those figures. So, I want to get into some of the applications here. At the very least, having a transmitter communicator at the watt level, as you've described, would open up the equivalent of new spectrum in the gravitational realm. Right. And that's something that's currently spread pretty thin in the electromagnetic spectrum. So at the very least, in terms of applications, you could think that we might be at least doubling the amount of spectrum available for communications devices. Right. Yes. Well, uh, everything that we communicate by is by electromagnetic waves, radio waves, microwaves, uh, optical, actually, too. And so um it's all electromagnetic, but this opens up a totally new, qualitatively new channel of communications, which is gravitational waves. Now, uh, it's been thought uh, by the uh, community generally that the uh, this communications by gravitational waves would be essentially impossible because it's so hard to generate gravitational waves because of the fact that uh, Newton's constant G is a very tiny number. But the secret here is that we're not using Newton's constant, but we're using something called a gyromagnetic ratio of the electron, which has been uh, measured. And it's uh, very large. It's on, a, on the order of 10 to the 11 of coulombs per kilogram. So it's a huge, uh, uh, coupling uh, compared with the usual Newtonian coupling. And so it's a totally new conception of how to couple two gravitational waves. Mm. Okay. Well, so another advantage of gravitational waves is that they aren't blocked by materials. So like right now, currently uh, Wi-Fi routers with electromagnetic waves, you hit a wall or tree leaves the correct length and that can block it 
redirect it, you know, all sorts of uh, difficult situations there. In, in the case of gra gravitational waves, that doesn't happen. They just go right through. It also potentially means, if I understand correctly, that you could transmit through the Earth instead of relaying around it with satellites, right? Yes, exactly. That's uh, the new aspect is that the Earth is believed to be, although we don't know this for sure because We've never had any kind of transmitter or receiver for gravitational waves, uh, as I'm sort of sketching how to do it, but it's been, not been done yet. And so we don't know that the, but we suspect, it's generally believed that the Earth is transparent to gravitational waves. And if so, then we could uh, find a communication channel that doesn't use satellites because we could uh, broadcast basically right through the earth from one uh, antipathy to the other one. Uh, so for example, we could uh, transmit from California to Australia uh, on a straight line. And, and that would uh, open up, of course, a completely new communication channel. Yeah. Well, in addition to that, another application of this, I just went down a big laundry list of things that this could be. Another application could be in modern cosmology. Uh, you can detect high frequency gravitational waves, if I understand correctly, which the LIGO project currently cannot. And it also occurred to me that the small size of these devices compared to something, you know, the size of LIGO might allow you to use arrays of them, similar to the way that we use radio telescopes, right, to provide enhanced resolution. Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, I think that the, that's a very good point. A LIGO, I would call it LIGO, that's the way I pronounce it, uh, is a, a very low frequency uh, detector of low frequency gravitational waves around 100 hertz. So uh, that, that's a very low frequency gravitational waves. But uh, we're talking about microwave frequency gravitational waves. And you might ask, well, where's the astrophysical source of this, and uh, this is speculative, but maybe there is a gravitational analog of what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which we do know exists. It's, uh, it, it's in the electromagnetic microwaves, it was discovered by Penzias and Wilson in the 60s, um, and uh, it, it covers the sky. It's, uh, it, it's isotropic and uh, and fairly homogeneous, so it's uh, it, it's known to exist and has a, a radiation temperature around three Kelvin, uh, very low temperature, but very easily detectable by standard uh, radio frequency techniques. Well, the analog of that may exist in gravitational waves. We if and this is big if that um, the universe. <clears throat> went through a phase where it uh, went, uh, and uh, it like electromagnetic waves, it thermalized with the hot Big Bang, okay? If thermalization did occur in the early stages of the universe, maybe there should be a, a three, three Kelvin background in, uh, in, uh, in, in microwave gravitational waves. And that now would be able to be detected uh, using this transmitter receiver system that we proposed using Ig spheres. Um, so that would open up a uh, 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 cosmology uh, for gravitational waves. But again, because gravitational waves are so transparent, uh, the universe is really transparent to gravitational waves, even much more so than to electromagnetic waves. So we would be probing uh, the very uh, way, way, way back to very near the Big Bang singularity, a uh, much earlier uh, epoch of the universe than the three Kelvin uh, electromagnetic microwave background that we do see. So th 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 this is speculative, of course. We, uh, we don't know this until we actually do the observations. But the other point you made is also really uh, important and 
uh, very good, which is uh, we could make um, an array of these detectors so that we have uh, a, what is called a phased array detector or a telescope array in in these uh, microwave re regions to look at uh, in high angular resolution at uh, the early universe. As, uh, uh, well, anyway, so it, it, it opens up uh, um, cosmological observations of uh, uh, gravitational waves at microwave frequencies, which uh, will, oh, I think, revolutionize our understanding of the early universe. That's uh, That has to be done, though, and we don't know that until we do it. Yeah, this is, it's wonderful. And then also the idea occurred to me that in addition to having, you know, being able to do cosmology in gravitational waves, you, you still have electromagnetic sensing. So you can do overlays of both, right? So you can do sensing of a star. And I mean, potentially you could even do optical as well using something like Kepler. So you could look at something in the optical spectrum. You could look at it in the radio spectrum. You could look at it in the gravitational spectrum and you could combine those signals and create a picture that is perhaps more complete and in depth than any one by itself. Oh yes, in fact, this uh, whole uh, way, way of doing astronomy is called multi-messenger astronomy, and uh, this would be a, a, a step in that direction. Um, so I did want to point out that, to the best of my knowledge, the speed of gravity is the same as the speed of light. So in terms of both measurement and communications, this would not open any doors to instantaneous communications, right? This would be very similar to radio. It would follow the speed of light, still about four light minutes to Mars. It would just be a different spectrum, but the same speed. Right, exactly right. Uh, but of course, this is now that you have a uh, transmitter and receiver, you can measure the speed of gravity, if you like, that you can uh, do... Uh, delay measurements uh, between a distant transmitter and receiver and time it and see how long it takes. And so uh, one would, could then in the lab measure the speed of, gra of the gravity. So that, that would be a new, new um, a step in our understanding of the speed of uh, gravity, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Well, how much would this device cost to build and test? And I think you'd mentioned a couple of values at the conference. And again, I would put a link in the notes to your full presentation. But I know this is something that you have looked at because it's it's actually feasible to construct this. What do you think that the cost and the time estimates might be? Uh, order of magnitude wise, it's um, on the order of half a million dollars to buy a dilution refrigerator. And um, that's what I think is required to uh, cool the uh, egg spheres down uh, so that they will levitate above superconductors. Uh, that's a well-known technology, levitating a magnet above a superconductor. So, uh, and, and uh, getting uh, the line width of the spin resonance down, and that's also been seen. So uh, uh, 500K for the Lucian refrigerator is the most expensive part of it, I think. Uh, and the time, well, of course, it, it's hard. To, the, the experiments are really hard to predict how they go. But on, on the, so it's within a year, I think, that we could do the experiment. That's my estimate. But I'm a, always an optimist, so maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think it's also important to point out that what you're talking about is definitely an initial experiment. And so any kind of commercial device that was produced later, you know, I, the, the cost can always go down and refinements can always be made on it. So, yes, uh, right. Ray, let me thank you so much for your time today. Again, it is truly an honor to be able to speak with you. The work that you have done has been inspirational. I've been following it for over 20 years. I know many of the people in my audience have as well. So 
Let me thank you so much. And I want to close by asking, what are the projects that you're working on other than this that we may hear more about in the near future? Well, um, uh, I, I am uh, looking at, uh, well, generally the inter, you know, the intersect uh, between quantum mechanics and general relativity. And there are many, many aspects of this, but this is the one that I think will bear fruit because uh, entangled states in quantum mechanics and uh, the principle of equivalence are in conflict or in tension with each other. And uh, the um, entangled states are non-local and, and, and the principle of equivalence is local. So there's an in intrinsic tension between these. And, and so in a, uh, saying this in a more general way, uh, I'm looking at uh, all sorts of quantum systems I've been working uh, with Jay Sharping, my colleague at UC said on superconductors and seeing if they interact with gravitational waves as mirrors, for example. That's an idea that I've uh, published some papers on. But uh, and anyways, uh, uh, looking at uh, quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity, I think it's a very fruitful direction uh, to do with physics research. So that's what I'm uh, focusing on right now. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Well, you're most welcome. Thank you.